The program you are about to see is part of a Cal State Fullerton President's Symposium, where we offered a forum to some of the nation's leading voices on the important and pressing issues impacting and challenging public higher education and our broader communities. We hope you enjoy the program and trust it will provide valuable insights about the important issues, impacts, and challenges facing us today. At Cal State Fullerton, our daily mission is education and knowledge creation. We're committed to being a leader in creating the future of higher education. It's my great pleasure today to introduce <clears throat> Thomas Edsel. I have uh, been reading his stuff since the days he worked for and wrote for the Washington Post, uh, which is a long time. And he stuck out in my memory then and continues to do so now as one of those journalists who thinks about things in a sort of very intelligent, very thoughtful, and frequently prescient kind of way. He did a book in 1992 called Chain Reaction, which I used in my classes and which informed my thinking, and I know the thinking of several of my colleagues, including Scott, with whom I've had this conversation. Uh, Professor Essel has the capacity to, and not everybody has the capacity to do this, <clears throat> to think about things that are going on in a society, weave them together in really intelligent, interesting kinds of ways, and do journalism of the kind that political scientists steal frequently in our classes. I hope you don't tell anybody that, but that is in fact how it works. Keith and I are political scientists, and I know there are other political scientists in the room. So let me tell you that my notion of the foundation of political science is that all political scientists think that all roads lead to politics. When we talk about economics or geography or culture or religion or income inequality or educational inequality or anything like that, sooner or later that stuff ends up as part of our political life. And sooner or later it ends up as matters of governance and of public policy. And that, for me, has been the hallmark of reading Professor Edsel's work over the years. He used to work, as I said, write for the Washington Post, presently writes for the New York Times. And to be sure I get the title right, he is Joseph Pulitzer II and Edith Pulitzer Moore Professor of Public Affairs Journalism, School of Journalism at Columbia University. He has a new book out, which I'm using in my class in the fall, in fact. So in addition to introducing him, I'm a good customer. Uh, and I want to thank you for the work you've done. I give you Professor Edsel. I, I just wanted to say anyone who buys my book has my vote. And uh, that was a very generous introduction, and uh, I really appreciate it. I, I sort of, listening to the sessions as we've gone through them today, I have revised what I plan to do. I didn't have the intelligence to change my PowerPoint I, in the same way that uh, Susan has, uh, she, she, her technology is <laughs> superior to mine. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I'm an old man, so uh, at any rate, the, uh, the question that seemed to come up or that comes out of the sessions this morning is how is it that the country could be moving in these very depressing ways uh, as Sheldon, Susan, everybody says, why hasn't the political system voiced anger about this and rejected it in its essence? I, and I, politics is my bread and butter. All these issues are very substantive we've been going through, uh, and I tend to share the views of people here uh, and I would suspect that the average ADA rating here is about 97, <laughs> um, as a guess. But, um, and I would include myself in that. Uh, but as a political observer, I'm the kind of person, if I see a car accident and there are four dead people, I wonder which party comes out ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> that's grotesque, I know, but that's, uh, uh, so w looking at these inequality developments and what's happened, what's been going on, I have, con it's been a concern of mine really for, since writing a book called The New Politics of Inequality in 1982, when most of you were not born uh, to the present, uh, 
how has the conservative movement and this economic policy evolved and gained so much strength? And why now, when things are even worse, uh, has it, hasn't the political system revolted? I don't, if you remember when uh, President Obama first took office, Rahm Emanuel made this famous quote saying, it, this, this recession is an opportunity. We would be crazy not to take advantage of it. What's interesting is that he, they could not really take advantage of it politically. Instead, the country moved right. Why was this? The, uh, you had the Tea Party, you had the Democrats getting wiped out in the House, 63 seats, I believe, they lost. And they lost substantial numbers in the Senate. Uh, and the whole policy agenda in Washington changed. The, it was, a, in fact, in terms of the substantive character of Washington, D.C., in terms of what the, uh, was before Congress, the deficit trumped everything. And the deficit was a major advantage to the Republican Party as a central issue because it inherently means austerity and cutting back. And one of the goals of the Republican Party, not, and this is a perfectly legitimate goal for a political party, is to reduce the welfare state. And it has been very effective, the Republican Party, if you look at the debt ceiling fight and if you look at the budget fight from the beginning of, of 2011 and then the debt ceiling fight, they really came out way ahead John Boehner came out of the debt ceiling and he said, I think we got 98% of what we wanted. And I don't think that's really a bad assessment uh, of the outcome. There were no tax increases. Basically, social programs have been taking the hit. And right now, it's been mentioned before in the, uh, by the panelists, the uh, House has just passed a legislation designed so that the sequestration of defense money will not have to take place. That was part of the deal in the, uh, uh, the debt ceiling bill. And in place of that, there will be, I think, 1.8 million people will lose their food stamp benefits. I don't know how many million people will have their Medicaid uh, benefits either cut or eliminated altogether. And unemployment, I believe, gets reduced. Is that right, Sheldon? Uh, but I, but at any rate, it is a it is a it is a real case study in the politics of austerity, basically, and the use of austerity as an issue and the deficit as an issue to press a policy agenda. Uh, now again, what how is it that the there has been this ascendance of conservatism? There's there been this brief movement to the left in 2006 and 2008, and then we have this movement back to, to basically, uh, uh, really, at even perhaps even more extreme, the politics that characterized the dominant themes of American elections, 1980, 1984, 1988, uh, and then with George Bush in 2000, and then uh, even more so in 2004. Uh, so let me try to explain this in a crude fashion. This is a chart showing how liberals and conservatives disagree on some basic value issues. Uh, what the chart shows is liberals are very supportive of the con when they're asked of, when they're asked do you do you agree or disagree or share this view i believe peace is extremely important liberals are very supportive conservatives are not in fact the difference is 1.42 standard deviations which is very substantial 0.5 is considered very large this is three times very large I, I believe offenders should be provided with counseling. Again, liberals, yes, conservatives, no. Liberals and Democrats are transferable in this case and pretty, pretty much. Uh, then if you go on the other end of the scale, you have to go down to the bottom one. 
the old fashioned ways and old fashioned values are still the best way to live. Conservatives, yes. Liberals, no. Uh, then if certain groups stayed in their place, we would have fewer problems. Conservatives, yes. That includes Cal State, Fullerton, and the students. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but the one that is interesting is that, remember that with the liberals, peace had a huge high value. Here, war is sometimes the best way to solve a conflict. Conservatives, yes, very strongly. Liberals, no. And again, the difference is uh, one and a half standard deviations, which is a mega difference statistically. I, I'll trust these guys to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's right. I'm not a statistician. Uh, the reason I raise this to begin with is that the left and right have differences that are significant and they run deep. One of the dilemmas of the Democratic Party has been encapsulated by the book uh, that Tom Frank wrote, what is the matter with, What's the Matter with Kansas? And his conclusion was that basically Kansas working class people had been suckered by the Republican Party into voting against their economic interests because they were because they put a higher value on abortion or school prayer or gay marriage or whatever the culture war issue was. Uh, I think that is a way oversimplification of the reality. There are these very wide value differences, and for that I would recommend a book by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, called The Righteous Mind, he does a very good job examining in great detail these value differences. And liberals and conservatives have very different values. The important thing is that white working class voters tend to be conservative in this value structure. And they are the ones who have left the Democratic Party in droves. In fact, that's the white, whites without college degrees are Obama's biggest problem going into 2012. They have been the biggest problem for Democrats now for quite a while. That's not true of whites with college degrees. Um, this is uh, it's too hard. This is from the hate book, but it's now religiosity is another way to look at this. If you're religious, if you go to church, that's the normal way to measure things you are a Republican. If you go weekly, you are a Republican, or more often than that. If you are an atheist, you are a Democrat. <laughs> now, now you, that, it's just, that, uh, it, there, is a, there are some atheists who are Republicans, and there are some very religious people who are Democrats. But the overall trend, the, it's, it's a correlation that is, an angle like this on any kind of mapping of going from no religion to very religious, the upswing for Republicans goes straight up. Not straight up, I'm sorry, angled up. Uh, here's another one, age. Well, here again, uh, Republicans are, are, this is the, the long range problem Republicans face that their, elect, their voting block is old people. Used to be back in the 80s, Republicans saw the elderly as their adversaries. They were the people who had been brought up and had roots in the Roosevelt New Deal era. And Grover Norquist, who's a famous uh, leader of the right, he runs Americans for tax reform, he used to joke that he loved reading the obituary pages because almost all the stories were about Democrats dying. <laughs> uh, the opposite is true now. Republicans are filling the obituary pages. Uh, and uh, the Democrats are the young ones. So you don't see Grover looking at page A42 anymore. Um, I want to skip past this. I may come back to it. 
Now, central to what has been taking place and one of the reasons why the conservative movement has been so effective is quite simply race. Not just pure black and white, but also uh, Hispanics. The Republican Party has become a, a fundamentally a white party. 82% of the hardcore of the Republican, of the people who vote Republican in primaries and even in, the, in general elections, 82% are white. The Democratic figure is something like 65%. The driving force behind the conservative movement that really took over American politics in many respects from 1968 through at least 1988 and, and then on in with, it, with the Bush II administration were, as I said, working class whites. They left the Democratic Party by the millions. Uh, and you can see here in this well, maybe that's, oops, no, uh, here you can, oops, you can see I'm not like Susan a pro at this stuff. Uh, blacks from 2008 and 2012, blacks are if anything slightly stronger for Obama, Hispanics are virtually the same, if anything the margin is a little higher. Whereas whites have fallen off. That's where Obama has his problems going into 2012. Uh, and again, you can see the age, uh, young people. There's been some fall off, but they're pretty strong uh, for Obama. Older people are a uh, majority for Romney and were a solid majority for McCain. Uh, Again, here the college, it's, what's important here is, again, some college or less. These compared to white, these are all whites only. Uh, the, some college or less, which is the way a lot of people now define the white working cl class. It's, it's hard to describe, you don't have lunch pail workers or Jill and Joe six pack, but one measure is that you just haven't gone to college. And you've seen from the previous stuff how much not going to college affects your income. And a lot of liberals would have thought having their income fall like that would mean you'd leave the Republican Party and join a party where you, that might help you try to get ahead. That is not the case. The some college are, again, among whites, Obama's big problem. The sum, th those who earn less than 50,000. Again, a big problem for Obama. Uh, men are a big problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I have been in uh, Democratic campaign headquarters in various, I mean, not the, where, congressional campaigns and so forth, and they, you hear people saying, I just wish we could disenfranchise every white guy in this district. <laughs> uh, it, um, uh, but again, the values that men have compared to the values that women have, their policy agenda, their support for tax cuts, they, they, their views towards the uh, social safety net, men are much more to the right on all of these issues than women. Uh, this will happen in, like you could take white evangelicals and they will be conservative, but the men will be much more conservative than the woman. And you can take uh, black men and black women, and again, they will be very liberal, but the women will be more liberal. It's a difference, basically, with every demographic group. I, this is really, just shows the kind of issue, this is gonna be very important in the campaign. The, uh, this, this chart shows those issues where the Republicans have a natural advantage. 
uh, people trust the Republican Party. Percent of uh, uh, voters who say these issues are very important. Uh, Republicans have a 23 point, or 23 percent more concerned with the budget deficit, 14 percent more on taxes, 11 more on abortion. If the Republicans can have the presidential election fought over these issues, they're going to win. Conversely, these are issues that where the Democrats come out ahead. Environment, education, birth control, Medicare, and health care. There's going to be a war in the current campaign to define what is the agenda. And you're going to find it's going to be fought like crazy. It will not be fought in this state because they assume you guys are going to be Democrats. But if you lived in Michigan or if you lived in Wisconsin, uh, you would already be inundated, or Florida, Colorado, there's about a dozen states that all the money is going to go into, and they're, they're going to spend less than a dime here in California, uh, except maybe the one place you might see it if you watch the Super Bowls where they'll buy some ads. But that's beyond that, you, all the ads, all the direct mail, everything is going to be concentrated in those dozen states, and both sides are going to try to force the debate onto the issue favorable to them. This shows you what's been happening with the, minor oops, sorry, the minority vote. Dem the darker line, oh, come on. This dark line, that's Democratic Party. This is the share of the, Dem of the party, what is it? The percent that is non-white, it's been growing steadily up to the point now where it is around 36, 37 percent. Republican Party has been only tiny growth. The Re Democratic Party is the party of diversity. That sounds good, but it has costs too. One of them is, this is the core New Deal coalition, which was the white Jill and Joe six-pack that we're talking about. They, they have basically abandoned the Democratic Party and joined the Republican Party and are now majority uh, uh, Republican and have been so since roughly 1992. But the trend line has been steady, if you follow this. And it's, uh, it starts in 19, this starts in 1960. And the beginning shifts are really the, the white working class in the South and then you get more and more the Reagan Democrats, who were the, like Detroit suburbs and so forth, that Reagan won. Then Newt Gingrich's angry white men. It's been a, a ongoing building shift. Now, this is important policy-wise because what it means is that the Democratic Party is not a coherent economic constituency. In the New Deal period, the Democratic Party could legitimately say, and voters could, would legitimately believe, that the Democratic Party is the party of working people versus the people who own companies. It, the claim to be broadly representative was there. The, with the fracturing of the Democratic Party, i.e. the loss of white working class voters, the Democratic Party cannot make that claim. And I think this has been un an underlying problem for Obama where his message of, you know, from everything from health care to tax policy is not heard, even though it may well be beneficial to white working class voters, it's not heard that way. It is heard as being one that is being, that it's gonna benefit blacks or minorities or women or an identity group as opposed to a broader class constituency. The other half of this is that the Democrats have made up for these losses and the, uh, this decline by picking up the support of well-educated whites, especially the professional class, not the business class, 
but prof white professionals have become increasingly democratic. In fact, they are the, it's, the fast, it's one of the fastest growing democratic constituencies. And as some of you may know, whites with advanced degrees are overwhelmingly democratic. That's fine for winning elections, and it was crucial to Obama winning in 2008 and for the Democrats winning in 2006, but it is a problem for the party as a promoter of an agenda because the agenda of this professional class elite is basically the culture war issues. It is very pro-abortion rights, very pro-women's rights. It is, if you go to the Upper West Side, or if you go here to Santa Monica, if you go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, or Madison, Wisconsin, whatever, and you go to Starbucks, people are not gonna be talking about food stamps and unemployment benefits. They're gonna be talking about the danger of the Christian right. It is a different worldview, a different agenda. You can see this, if you a Democratic candidate running for president is dead if he tries, if he were to come out against abortion rights. It's a litmus test issue that is a killer. Whereas a Democrat who is kind of squishy on spending for uh, health care and uh, food stamps and unemployment benefits might have trouble, but it would not be a killer. That's a, that's a big difference from the way it was before. The, um, this, uh, it's sort of more of the same information about the same. This shows you how basically college graduates who, have, who identified themselves as liberal in the 70s have become much more democratic over time. And even moderates have become more Democrats, democratic. But that, uh, this is the one I was talking about. Uh, if you're an atheist, you're a, a Democrat. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, percent voting for Obama the, is, is this ish line here. If you go to church more than once a week, 20% uh, voted for Obama. Whereas if you never go to church, you're up at uh, basically 70%, or well, almost 70%. That's, that's a, a 50 percentage point difference. We're talking mega differences. Uh, I would note that these differences were not there prior to 19, 1980 is when they first became clear. And that's when the Christian right first began to emerge, but that's a whole other separate issue. Uh, this is on abortion. It used to be that if you were uh, Demo people who were Democrats back here, and this is basically, this is about when Roe v. Wade happens. The half Democrats were uh, pro-abortion rights, half were pro-life. Now the pro-life people have left the party and the pro-choice people have joined the party. So abortion is now a big dividing issue. These are interesting and I don't quite know what to make of them. Uh, Mar uh, Marty may have better, uh, I, I don't know if these are correlations or causal relations, uh, but they are intriguing. Uh, as inequality has grown, polarization has grown. I don't know what to say. As the more immigration we have, the more polarized we've been. Again, I don't know what to, uh, uh, this list, it shows, and I think this is important for a lot of the thinking of whites, not the nice, good guy whites in this audience, but whites generally. <laughs> I, I, they worry about their status as the majority of the pop, as the dominant, hegemonic, whatever you want to call it, uh, force in society. And they are on the losing end of the stick demographically. The, these are, this show you uh, the decline from 75% down to 
52%. This says 2050. The word is really that they're going to be less than 50% in 2042, but according to some census work. Uh, and all the minority groups, especially Hispanics, are growing like wildfire. Blacks, uh, less so. But Asians uh, and Pacific Islanders are growing uh, very substantially. Um, this, I, I, I would not dismiss this as a source of anxiety in the white community. And I think it also combines significantly with the idea that America is going to be eclipsed or equaled by China very soon in ter economic terms. All these combined to create a sense of threat. And one of the strongest voting motivations that you can Republicans have found is when you can find out what people's anger and fear points are. People vote out of hatred, not out of love. And you can say you're going to do wonderful things for people. You get some support. You can say, I'm going to beat the crap out of those guys who are going to hurt you. If you'll get a lot of support. And that's what they want to hear. And so all these are very important factors in, in the uh, process. This is the growing uh, strength of the minority vote. Oops. Uh, in 1992, it was at roughly 13 or 14 percent. By 2020, it'll be 35 percent. Interestingly, before somewhere right around here is when the minority vote will be the majority of the Democratic Party vote. That, that'll happen way before there's a major, uh, and that's going to happen somewhere in the 2020 to 2025 time period. Th that is interesting, and if you look at cities that have gone through the process of becoming majority black, Chicago, Baltimore, Philadelphia, that process is a politically a very traumatic period. And the ability of the Democratic Party to become majority minority and maintain cohesion is going to be a big test. Republicans are clearly insulting the Hispanic community in many respects in their rhetoric and in their comments. And, but at some point, all their strategists know they're going to have to switch gears because they're going to just get killed. And in the long run, the strategists, not the elected officials, the sort of nutcases like Steve King and uh, Tom Tancredo, but the people who know what the party needs to do in the long run, they're going to have to accommodate the Hispanic vote and start working on it. And they hope, ultimately, to tr create wedges between blacks and Hispanics. Who's going to get a bigger share of the pie? Uh, these kind of fights are already occurring in cities like Chicago, where where do you put a, mo a new model school? Do you put it in the black neighborhood or the Hispanic neighborhood? Where, uh, what kind of policy do you have for admissions to the school? All these issues get to be very intense, and if the, one of the strengths of the Republican Party has been its capacity to figure out what are the issues that are sitting there waiting to be capitalized on to become wedge issues? They did this very effectively with racial issues throughout the South and the North. Uh, and I think over time, they're going to try to do the same thing to break Hispanics loose from the Democratic coalition. Uh, now, when I talked about race, Race and economics are so intimately involved, you cannot separate the two. And, and now, Republicans have been fighting to protect tax breaks for the wealthy, including the 15% tax rate on dividend income. Dividend income is what you get from your stocks. Certain stocks pay dividends. For every dollar in dividend I income, that goes to whites, it's worth only 13 cents to blacks and 8 cents to whites. So there's a huge racial difference in the consequence of maintaining a low 
uh, tax rate on dividend income. What happened here? Disaster. Ah, here's employment. And there's a big drive. It's been very successful by the Republicans in reducing public employment in state and city government. Who gets hurt by that? This is, shows you the percentage of, uh, of the workforce in various sectors that is, oops, that is black and white. In the private sector, uh, that would be this one would be if it if that if it was at one it would be exactly the same level as the population at large. It's almost there, there in the private sector, but in the public sector, black rep, blacks are overrepresented at about 1.3 or more, and in the federal government it's very 1.7 1.7 and a half state. In other words, when you cut public employees you are disproportionately putting out of work blacks. I, here is when you, that no one's been ready to touch Social Security yet, but if and when they are, that this shows you what, what percentage of blacks, whites, and Latinos are dependent for, who are seniors, who are dependent for 80% of their income on Social Security. Less than half of whites are 45.6%, almost 60% of whites, and almost 65% of Latinos get 80% get of their income from Social Security. Social Security pays lousy money, and how that's virtual poverty. I think it pays about $14,000 a year. Uh, so if that's 80% of your income, it ain't much. Uh, but again, it shows you the difference in, the, in a policy. If you were going to cut Social Security, the, there's a big racial difference in the, in the, in the uh, consequence of that. This is just a Tea Party sign. You are not entitled. The word entitlement has taken on on the Republican side, a meaning that, as if it's a handout, and they don't, they, they have been very successful in conveying that quality. But uh, uh, this is this just shows you how Republicans and Democrats see things very differently. Uh, the light-colored bars, these. <laughs> are Obama not born in the United States. Here is Democrats, 15%, Republicans, 40%. I've actually seen data where that exceeds 40%. And, uh, but conversely, was 9-11 a conspiracy in part by the federal government? Democrats, 45%, i.e., was it a conspiracy by George Bush? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Republicans, uh, maybe 17 percent. So they have, people have very different the polarization has made people see the world very differently. They no longer agree on some basic facts of life. Here's an interesting one: the difference is capitalism a Christian? Does it fit with Christian values? In the general public. Uh, a plurality, 44%, say no, and 36% yes. Democrats, a clear majority, say no. Republicans, yes, and the Tea Party people, yes pretty loudly. You can be a capitalist and a Tea Party person and religious without any sense of, at least personally, being in conflict. This is just a, it's not really related to that, but it just shows you what multinational companies have been doing over the, uh, well, they did from 99 to 2009. They, they've moved jobs abroad and they've reduced their jobs domestically. That's a big problem, but that's not directly involved in this. This shows you again, this is Obamacare. Uh, the extraordinary difference of point of view on 
by evaluating uh, 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 the, the Obama's program. Democrats are overwhelming, they're the blue, overwhelmingly in favor, this is a great deal, uh, favor moderately. You move over here, suddenly the Republicans are just way off the charts. In other words, the middle dies. The, the, the extreme views are overwhelming. This is an interesting one. This shows you how voters were distributed as recently as 1984, even though polarization had begun before that. Uh, the, what's significant is that the middle is quite, it's, that's where the overwhelming majority of voters are. Uh, and the very conservative and very liberal are really tiny fractions. You move that to, let's see, to 2008, and the middle is still, dominant, but it's nowhere near what it was, and all the movement has been out from the center to the extremes. This, these are voters, not political leaders. Uh, part of this goes out of the fact that the elections now, the ones that are important are increasingly primary elections, that this is what happens in the, and not the general election. What this chart shows is the margin, the num percentage of marginals, the number of marginal seats and the number of safe seats in the, the marginal is striped and the other one's more solid. The marginal seats back in 1980 were clearly much higher than the number of uh, safe seats. The reverse by 2010 has happened, where now you have over 200 safe seats and only maybe 110 marginal seats. What that means is that People, these voters in safe seats only care about the threat of a primary challenger. And if you're a Republican, your primary challenger to be successful has to come from the right, so you're worried about your right flank. If you're a Democrat, the challenger is going to come from your left flank. So you, you, your political interests are pushed further to the extreme by this process. I. Uh, this, there's been some argument that uh, gerrymandering the political process where the p politicians do this has been the main cause. That's not really true. It's, it's a factor, no question. But the real fact is people are moving. Democrats tend to move and have Democratic neighbors. A Republican, say a Republican moves to Austin, Texas, which is a sort of a mixed area. He's going to look for the neighborhood where there are going to be pickup trucks where there are going to be gun holders in the back window, where the, the fishing boats out in the yard. A Democrat is going to look for those, you know, artistic striped flags, not American flags. <laughs> uh, and uh, for Volvos and Pri Priuses. <laughs> uh, uh, so you, you, you have people, it's called, a very good writer called Bill, Sh Bill God, he wrote a book called The Big Sort, where basically people are sorting themselves out geographically by ideology. You would have a very hard time creating a Republican district along the entire Pacific coast of the United States, except perhaps for, for the San Diego region. Aside from that, I, I believe it's almost solidly democratic right up the whole coastline. Same on the East Coast, d down to, uh, to Washington, D.C., not in the South. That's it. I, let me. Thank you. Uh, we've got a microphone back there, and in the interest of time, uh, figure maybe about 10 minutes for Q&A because we have a, a break yeah. coming up and other speakers. So please. Um, this week, uh, President Obama came out in support. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. So the question is, uh, this week, uh, President Obama came out with support of gay marriage. How is that going to affect him in the general election? Is that, is that going to be something beneficial or is it going to go against him? I, I think it could go either way, because it also was followed, as probably many of you know here, by this story about Romney uh, beating up this kid, or 
uh, a gay kid at the prep school he went to. Is everyone aware of that story? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, the, the country is, is very mixed on gay, gay rights issues in general, but it's been moving to the left. Whether it has moved far enough to the left for Obama, I'm not sure. Uh, but the country, one thing is pretty clear, the country does not support intolerance. And if the gay rights issue is be, gets used by conservatives and by Romney as, a, as one in which people see it as an intolerance to a people or a whole class of people, that'll work to Obama's strength. It, but if it makes it look like Obama is appeasing not that gays particularly, but that he is subject to the pressures from liberal special interest groups of all kinds, then it would hurt Obama. Where it will help him is in fundraising. The gay community has been holding back, and there are a lot of very good fundraisers and a lot of very rich gays who have not been uh, helping out. They've been angry at Obama, not just for this, but also for some other things that they would like to see him do. Uh, they are going to open their wallets now, and it's gonna, that's going to make a big difference. And Obama needs the money because the Republicans are much better equipped with super PACs this year, which can do the nasty work in campaigns and let the Romney campaign be the good guy while they're, they're the, the hard, hard men of the game. So I, it's unpredictable at this point. I don't know. Could we go back to um, the, the um, two slides before the end, uh, the distrib distribution of voters on governmental activism scale? What does governmental activism mean here? I don't know. I, I didn't use that chart. Oh. <laughs> oh, government activism is really, do you believe the government should intervene in various ways in the economy to make things better to, to reduce unemployment, to provide jobs, or do you believe the government should not do that and should cut taxes instead? Is the, is the common way that's often expressed in polls. I, what, by government activism, that really means government spending. Good question, though. Glad you asked that, actually. I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but most recently we've seen some austerity movements uh, taking place in, in Europe where they want to cut uh, safety nets for the population. Um, it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, seems like that's what's happening here in this country. Um, do, should we expect the same type of reaction from the population with regards to that? Well, I think... Uh that's a good question again. That, and I think if you go back to some of the slides that were presented earlier, I think uh, Spencer had uh, the one where the percentage of the country that sees itself as have as opposed to have not. Uh, overwhelming, I think it's 60% of Americans see themselves as haves. And those people are not about to rise up in revolt against a, an austerity government. It, it, uh, and that's been one of the big successes of the Republican Party, which has been to appeal to the part, to those voters who see themselves as haves and to treat the Democratic Party as the party of have-nots. What that has translated in many cases to is to a, and this is quite literal, the kind of language, one party, Phil Graham used this, the Democrats ride the wagons, the Republicans pull the wagons. Uh, Grover Norquist, the guy I mentioned, I think he uses that. There are tax users and tax payers. And that, to get that conflict going works very effectively. And it is one of the way that you see that expressed in the anger at public employees uh, after the two in coming out of the 2010 election, so it, it's it's a very effective division in that sense. No more. Yep. Go ahead. Is that one of them? 
Well, uh, you know, the Republican Party uh, in 2004, if you recall, uh, George Bush ran as an act of an expressed opponent of gay marriage. He, wanted to, he claimed he wanted to push a constitutional amendment uh, declaring all marriages should be between people of the opposite sex. I, that, they use that issue in a highly targeted fashion. What's, one thing, that, politics has become, the whole new area of politics in the last decade is micro-targeting. The campaigns now have information about every one of you, literally. They know that you like to go kayaking, that you buy from L.L. Bean, and you drive a Subaru, and, or, or conversely, you drive a Cadillac Escalade, and whatever, they, and they know whether or not you have kids, and whether, uh, uh, they know if you get religious magazines, or if you get men's health, or whatever it is. They take all that data, they use polling data to, to reinforce it, and they can find out who is what. One of the things they did in 2004 was they sought out, using this data, black women who really opposed gay marriage. And that uh, blacks are the exception in that they are religious and they're still Democrats. Uh, and some of them are deep, many are deeply religious and deeply, uh, as you had in this state, the, the big fight over the, the uh, the gay issue where blacks were widely seen as killing gay rights and the gay community was very angry at the black community for as I recall. I wasn't here, but that's how I recall. The these are uh, they, the, the, the Republican Party did things like in uh, Cleveland sought out and tried to find by subscriptions to religious magazines, other things, women in the black community who were very concerned about these social issues. And they were, if you look at the exit polls from 2000 to 2004, the black vote shifted towards Bush, which in, not, it's the blacks overwhelmingly supported John Kerry, but less so than they supported Al Gore in 2000. Those tiny margins, another place they used this with great effect was in southwest West Virginia, which is a very, that's white evangelical territory. These targeted messages, which you can do by radio or by direct mail, because they now have addresses for every registered voter, and then they have this ID material on every <coughs> registered voter, and they can, do that. Both sides do it. Obama in 2008 did a huge catch up on this exact same stuff. So these issues are very, you can't, you can, what's happened is that micro targeting has allowed you to go beyond television. So you know, you can avoid the negatives of someone saying, I'm not going to vote for a guy who's using gay marriage. That's outrageous. You don't want to, you want to avoid angering that person, but you do want to get to the voter who says, he, he, uh, the Democrat supports gay marriage, the hell with him. So if you can do it without cost, which is what micro-targeting allows you to do, it is a huge advantage and it makes these issues much more difficult to predict because you cannot use general poll data. You've got to, everything gets segmented, you have niches and different ge geography and constituencies.